Meeting week town hall meeting. We've held, this is our fifth one this year, so we've gone in four other wards. One was last night in Ward 8. Tonight we're here in Ward 6. What we, what we usually do is I give a few opening remarks. We have a couple of uh, short presentations for you on some of the things that are going on in the city. And then, of course, we just take your questions, your comments, anything that you'd like to talk about. Now, we do have, and I'm glad to say, we have Lori Wilshire, who's the president of the Board of Aldermen. Thank you, Lori. Rick Dowd, who's uh, the, one of the, uh, the aldermen from Ward 2, head of the Budget Committee. Ken Gidge, who is the alderman from Ward 6, has had back surgery and has been having some trouble. So he, uh, he couldn't make it tonight. I mean, he wanted me to give you his regrets. Can I, can I jump yes, in yeah. Quickly? If any of you have issues that need to be addressed by the city, um, you can reach out to me or any of the aldermen at large because your alderman has been under the weather. So I am there, I'm available. So feel free. Yeah, so he's, you know, he's had uh, a couple of rounds. I mean, he's having back problems. And so he hasn't been up and around as much as he, uh, as he could have. Uh, uh, we also have Mark King, who's one of our state reps from Ward 6, and, and uh, Francis Nutter-Upham, who's also um, nutting Upham, excuse me. No, no. Nutter, right. Nutter-Upham. Nutter Wong uh, is the other one. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so we want to thank them for coming because we might get into a few state issues. So over the course of the last f few years, we, we have been working on a lot of different things. One, trying to add jobs to the community, bring businesses, grow the economy. And we've, we've had a lot of progress in that regard. There have been a lot of businesses. Uh, he's signaling. What you want me to? I need you, you to stand over here so okay. we can actually see you, Mayor. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> sorry. So there have been a lot of uh, jobs. New businesses have come to the area, like Prudential Overall Supply over in Simon Street. Also, jobs have been added by BAE, by Amazon, by Boston Billiards, and many, many other organizations. So we've added hundreds of jobs. We've, we've seen a growth of the tax base, which helps to subsidize services in all of our neighborhoods. Downtown, the goal was to provide 500 units at least of new downtown housing to, again, grow the tax base, but also to provide a stronger business climate for downtown businesses for, with more customers and to uh, just provide, provide more housing options for people of all ages. We are trying to be a city that works for all generations. Uh, we have started paving a lot of streets, 31 miles this year, after 25 miles last year. Now, over the course of history, we have done more like, you know, five or 10 years ago, or th four or five or six years ago, it was more typical that we were doing maybe five maybe six, maybe seven miles. That puts the city with 300 miles of streets on a 50 or 60 year replacement schedule. So the Board of Aldermen uh, and I have adopted a paving plan of action, we call it, to make a dramatic progress with respect to paving over a period of a few years. And Lauren is gonna tell you a little bit more about the paving, paving program. We have made improvements with schools. We made it all of our elementary schools. We added full day kindergarten in all elementary schools, which is, was not the case before. Uh, when I was mayor the first time, we started public kindergarten, and now a couple of years ago, we made all of our kindergartens full day kindergarten. Uh, we have, of course, uh, added a lot of activity downtown. We're trying to make Nashua a place where we can retain our young people, where our young people want to stay, and maybe we can attract some new people because without a younger generation, a thriving younger generation, in the future we as those, uh, uh, who, when we sort of leave our legacy of how Nashua is left, we in our generation want to make sure that we're leaving a city that is as good for our young people or better than what we have. But one thing that I did want to talk about tonight is property taxes. 
which is always a focus of city government. Now the balance every year is to try to provide services that are, that are needed, fire, police, schools, public works, paving, everything else, uh, while at the same time trying to maintain a tax rate that is affordable to all who live here. One problem that every municipality in New Hampshire faces is that over time, the state government has done what is commonly referred to as downshifting. When they have a problem, they either withdraw revenue from the cities and towns or impose additional obligations onto the cities and towns so that, proper, so that they can balance their budget and, the, and, increases in, and increase property taxes pay for that. The biggest, and there are many, many examples over a long period of time. Uh, the biggest example is the, the question of city pensions. Now, city pensions are not negotiated or determined by the city of Nashua. And the reason for that is that the city, along with all other municipalities in New Hampshire, cities and towns, are part of the state pension system. And the way that happened is back in about the 1960s, maybe the late 60s, the state of New Hampshire started its pension system and wanted the cities and towns to join. And in order to get cities and towns to join, told us that they would always pay 35% of all municipal pension costs. Great, so everybody joins. Then uh, that goes on, great, for 40, 40 50 years. And then uh, eight, eight, six or eight years ago, as for whatever reason, they had some budget issues, the state went from the 35% to 30 to 25 to zero. Now that has cost, with, with, a, with an annual pension, and they mismanagement the system and uh, greatly increased the contributions that had to be made by the employer and by the employees. So the end result for the city of Nashua has been that the cumulative total of the violation of that promise has cost the city almost $50 million. That's 5-0 over the last six or eight or 10 years. That's a lot of money for a municipality. Uh, so this year, we faced an additional challenge with the budget. Uh, we, we wanted to maintain the quality of services. We wanted to keep our property tax rate as low as we possibly could. Uh, we of course, kept up with the paving. Uh, we made some improvements in schools. We've begun to look, and Rick is doing this through the Joint Special, at a project to improve this middle school as well as Elm Street and Penichuk. Uh, we added some fire dispatchers paid by the ambulance company. They're paying us some money now. Uh, but we faced a big challenge, which was the fact that employee health care went up Three million dollars, eleven percent. So overall, the budget went up about two point nine percent. But the but for that one line item, that is, the healthcare costs, the budget was only up one point six percent. Last year's budget was up as a total one point six percent. Now we are we see a little light of the light at the but so I know property taxes are a concern and I know so but I want you to know that for the board of aldermen and I that is always a you know a thing that people are always thinking about we want to have a good police department we want to have a good fire department we want to offer good education to our kids but on the other hand we want to try to do it as with it, with property taxes as low as we you know as low as we can get them we do see some light at the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel, as a result of the good work of our legislators, because the House budget that's been passed this year, for the first time, would actually return more money to the cities and towns than, and to Nashua in the form of general assistance and education aid than, uh, than in the past. So this is the first time that there's really been a reversal of a decades-long trend. These budgets have not been 
finalized. Finalized right? because the Senate passed a version which also is good for us, but different than the House. And the governor is asking for reductions in the amount of help that we would get. So there needs to be some kind of, we don't know what's going to happen, right? Uh, but anyway, thanks to our legislators, we think that the, the picture this year is going to be a little different. But as much as they can do, it doesn't, you know, it, there's so much that's been done in the past, of course, it won't reverse everything all in one year. Uh, but those are some of the issues that we're working on. And of course, we want to take your questions and comments. So what we wanted to do was ask uh, Lauren to give you a short presentation so uh, you, know, you don't get too much into the details, if you don't want to, on paving. And then Sarah Marchant is going to tell you a little bit about the Riverfront Master Plan and what's being planned for the, for the Riverfront. So Lauren's going to come over here. And uh, Lauren works for Public Works, the, Board of Pub uh, the Department of Public Works. And she's going to tell you a little bit about what's going on with the paving. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm holding this, not because I need a microphone for you to hear me. And those of you that know me know I do not need a microphone. But the, we're, they're videotaping this, so I was asked to hold this when I speak. The mayor is all wired up, so he doesn't need it. So I imagine all of you think your roads are perfect, and the paving process is excellent. <laughs> all right. So there's a lot that people um, don't understand about paving. So like the mayor mentioned, we are doing, it is a very aggressive plan to fix roads that probably should have been fixed 20 and 30 years ago. We let them go too long, and now we're almost in a crisis uh, mode for repairing them. It's not just the surface of the streets that is a problem, it's the infrastructure below it, which is what is causing the multiple digs on the single streets. It's holding up paving in a lot, of, a lot of times. We'll start to get ready to pave, and then Liberty will call us uh, and say, we have gas leaks in the street. You've got to stop and let us fix them. Because once we pave a street, there's a five-year moratorium on that street. You cannot open that street for any reason unless it's an emergency. So we don't want there to be any emergencies once we pave these streets, because we want them to last a very, very long time. So it does slow our progress down. Um, we've had a lot of questions about why did you tear up my street and walk away from it? And did you forget us? And we get a lot of phone calls about that. So no, we did not forget you. So the way the paving works is a company we contracted out you know, for their expertise and their equipment and their, and their labor, which we don't have enough of. And they come in and they mill maybe 10 streets that's in their contract for, the first, for that phase. So they do all 10 streets, and then they come back, and their equipment goes elsewhere, right? Because they only have so much equipment, and they work all over the state. Then they come back, and they adjust the structures. Then they come back on all 10 streets. And then they come back, and they do put down the first layer, which is called the binding layer, or shim. They have to let that sit a little while. They may have to make some structure adjustments. And then they do their final paving, and if necessary, their stripe. It can take anywhere. I say two weeks, but that's pretty much a lie on my part. So I'm going to say it takes three to four weeks to up to eight weeks or more, depending on the size of the street and any issues they encountered when they opened the street. We also get a lot of calls about, well, this street around the block is so much better than mine, and you're doing, my, you're doing their street and not my street. So your street may have a PCI, which is called a paving condition index. We rate every street in the city from zero to 100, zero being the worst. So yes, your street may be far worse than your neighbors. You may have a 19 PCI, which is terrible, and they may have a 60. So why are we doing their street? There's basically two important things to know about paving, reclamation and resurfacing. So reclamation is when the street is so bad, we have to go right down to the dirt and the rocks. We literally take it apart and rebuild it from scratch. That is a lot of money and a lot of time. Then you have the resurfacing, where you go down a couple inches, and you've still got some binder on the, on the bottom there, like you saw on Spitbrook Road. You might have seen it over on, um, you're still seeing it on Broad Street. And you're now seeing it on Amherst Street. So they're not necessarily total reclamations. They're resurfacing. And then they come in and put a couple inches down, and they're out of there. So resurfacing is much cheaper and much faster. So if we did the reclamations first, the really bad streets, by the time we got around to the resurfacing streets, they'd be reclamations. So now we're doubling our paving budget, and we're taking a lot more time. So there is a method to our madness. We, we kind of do know what we're doing here. And we're trying to save the taxpayers a lot of money and do the best job we can with paving your streets. Now, I know there were some questions when I first walked in about 
utility work in the streets. How and about Kinsley Street? That's oh, another. wait, 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 I might help. Kinsley Street is in Ward 6, by the way, so. So I, I was, was going to save Kinsley Street for last. <laughs> Kinsley Street is, literally wants to make me quit my job every day. So that is one of the oldest streets in this city, and the infrastructure is literally falling apart beneath it. There's sewers from the 1800s, the gas companies fighting all sorts of issues with their pipelines, as is Penichuk. So um, jobs, they tell us, OK, like last year, OK, we're going to get this done in three or four weeks. Well, it's an eight-week project, because when they open the road and they see what they're finding as far as the infrastructure, it's doubling their estimates. And there's nothing we can do about that. The work has to get done. Wouldn't you rather they do the work, we pave the road, and then you're good for 20 years, and then we're all retired and living in the Lakes region when the road needs to be repaved. So Kinsley Street is a nightmare, but I, I, don't, I don't know if I should say this out loud. I believe we are getting close in the next week or two to start milling it for final pave. Do not come after me if that doesn't happen, because I know I'm going to get a call from the gas company saying, wait. Something just popped up or whatever, but. That did happen last fall. So it, it looked did. like we were going to pave it last fall, but then there, were, then there was bad weather. Then they discovered more leaks, especially down near Maine. Yeah. And so there's yeah. more digging. So you've seen all that work down there. And that's why they discovered leak after leak and collapse after collapse. And the laterals were collapsed. It was just, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. It was just horrific. So this year, first thing, we got them right out there as soon as the weather was good enough in April. We have such a short season in, in this state that, um, and then I know, I know it, it, it involves rush hour and waiting to get through an area for 45 minutes like on Amherst Street, but there's only so many hours they can work, and we have such a short period of time to do our work that it is inconvenient. And we do apologize for that. We are always trying to keep traffic moving. We're always changing plans to try and make it better for you. But um, we're hoping to have Kinsley done before the snow flies 100%, and you can just coast right down that street. Then you're going to be calling me for speed bumps, stop signs, and traffic lights. And I'm going to tell you in advance, you're not getting them. Just enjoy that street and, and just move along. Um, does anybody have, um, oh, and the other thing, um, it's sewers. So I talked about our sewers needing a lot of work. There's a process, CIPP, where you line the sewers. So the sewers that are not collapsing, are being lined, and they should get us another 40 to 50 years out of them. It's much cheaper, it's a good use of our money, and it's a good use of our time. So we've hired a company that specializes in it, and you'll see steam coming out of the ground. We are not putting in a subway. <laughs> it is sewer lining, so, um, and that's going to save us time and money, and it'll save our sewers. So, but we are, we are having to replace a lot of sewers over on East Hollis, D Street, like in that area, they're just collapsing. And so that is taking up a lot of time. Um, that's about it. If you have any questions, I would be happy to take those for you at this time. Yes. So I'm not sure if this is. Uh, can you, now, can you ask the question into the mic there? That would be great. I'm not really sure that's um, related directly to what you're talking about, but um, I live on Forest Park Drive, and we don't have gas. And I know that our street is, has not been paved yet. and. We were looking to get some gas lines in before the plan to repave those streets are in. And I don't know what the process is. How do I go about doing that? We have gas on Lund Road. There's gas on Almont, but there's none on Forest Park. So well, um, Now, I wasn't really aware that Forest Park didn't have gas. So that's not something that Leafs I've encountered before. So we could inquire, try to find out about what the gas company's plans are and get back to you. Okay. And we I, would be the glad to. The reason why I was asking was because I know that our street, I looked it up, and it's going to be in the next few years that they're going to. You have a pretty good PCI, so. Yeah, so. It's not going to be that soon, I don't think. Good. Okay. okay. So that, that was my question. I think it would also help if um, you contacted the gas company and expressed an interest yeah, in bringing I gas to your street. I did email a few years ago, but. I would follow up with a phone call to their customer service line to Liberty Utilities. Yeah and make them aware and say you'd like to speak to somebody about potentially getting gas lines in before the paving process. Because they have actually, we got this wonderful bond to help us with the streets, but the utility companies did not receive money. So they are struggling to keep up with our progress. So when we become very um, 
annoyed with the way they're doing their business, they're really tr doing their best to keep up with us because we are moving at an aggressive pace and they did not receive the same funding that we did to do the surfacing. So um, we appreciate their efforts for as much as they've done, but definitely give them a call and, and um, I'll call also. Um, maybe I'll give you my card and then you can just email me and then I'll be able to contact you, okay? Any other questions? Yes. <coughs> this is a this is a little past the season, but this past winter there was a lot of issues with potholes. <laughs> it could get, so the Glazer streets are not being redone right now. Can you address what's going to be happening in the future? I'm thinking of like East Dunstable and Robinson Road near where I live. Yeah, I live down there too. So yes, there have been, been a, potholes are horrendous in this city, and we do try to keep up with them. The winters are changing. So we're getting 50 degrees in February with rain, and the next night it's 20 degrees. So it, it's, it's not just us, it's, it's all over the Northeast. Um, so what's gonna happen as we start with this paving process, we paved, I don't know how many streets last year, 20 or 30. As we add up those streets that we're paving, the potholes, we will have less to address. Like Kinsley Street literally was a full-time job last year with potholes. You know, we have Pine Hill, Kinsley Street, Broad Street was a full-time job, and it's being paved this year. So as those big jobs fall off our radar, we'll be able to keep up better with the other areas where, you know, we try to keep the main roads as pothole-free as possible initially, and then we go to the sides, and then, of course, the three or four footers where you can lose a small child, we try to get to those right away. But um, yes, as we pave our roads and we have less and less to do, we'll be able to be more aggressive and more responsive to our potholes in the future. We're really looking forward to that, I can't tell you. And one thing that people often ask, or sometimes ask, well, you, you filled a pothole in the wintertime and it, it didn't work because you know, the gravel came, the, the asphalt came up and now it's a pothole again. Now in the wintertime, the only alternative is to use what we call cold patch, which is not a permanent fix because it is not hot asphalt. It is not really a binder. There is no hot asphalt in the wintertime. So what you see is, is a temporary patch in the winter, the cold patch, which sometimes has to be replaced again during the winter. And certainly when the good weather comes, it then needs to be redone with hot asphalt. So sometimes we get questions that don't you know, about well, we've, the stuff you put in it didn't stick. And the reason for that is that there is no permanent pothole uh, fix during, during the winter time. It's only a temporary fill of the pothole. Yes, in the back. Well, hi. Um, now, I, I'm going to rely on memory here. I, I don't have the figures. But I did uh, print out some pages from the proposed budget. Uh, yes. That we had. And it looked like for wastewater, we had a budget of around 16.8 .8 million. The available funding was up $52 million. And then it looked like we had end up spending about 13 million more than what the original budget was. Could you just explain what happened? I assume it was all good, done for good reasons. I just wanted to. So the um, at the at the at the wastewater treatment plant, there is a, the wastewater treatment plant was done in uh, the late 80s, middle to late 80s, and as it is aged. Now it's 30 some years old. Not only has the, the required processing increased, the requirements, this, the, the regulation tightened up, but also a lot of the equipment and the, the, uh, uh, everything that's there has begun to wear out. And that was compounded by the fact that for a period of time there was really little maintenance at the, at the, at the treatment plant. So in about, um, so a couple, so so uh, a couple things happened. Number one, back some 15 or 20 years ago, there was a huge cash balance in in the fund, which was really necessary because of all of the future improvements that foreseeable future improvements that were required. So even so, there was a huge cash balance, but all of that cash was really needed to. Even though we're not going to, we let's say this is. Uh, you know, year two, or the year 2005, all of this money is needed 
to do future improvements, but, it, but those improvements won't be done immediately. This is a long-term process. Now, the Board of Aldermen made the decision and uh, was driven by people who aren't here now, but they made the decision, well, since we have such a big cash balance, let's cut, let's cut, the, let's cut the sewer fees, which was done. But the problem was that it eroded the cash balance and it, it eroded the cash balance to, to the point where really at this point, given everything that's required, we, we've had to raise rates a few times. So what you're seeing, uh, and that's kind of just a background explanation, what you're seeing is the 13 million is really kind of the operating budget, uh, including kind of normal repairs. But the, those bigger numbers over and above that are major items that are being replaced. Everything that, and it, we could get you a more detailed presentation on what's been done there, but every time something comes up, it's like a million dollars. You know, a screen needs to be replaced. That's a million dollars. Um, the wet weather facility isn't working right. That costs a few million dollars to fix. Uh, there had been more, the, the maintenance over uh, leading up to about five or six years ago was not great, just like the roads. So all kinds of stuff, all the pumps have to be replaced. It's just the amount of money that gets spent there is very large. And these are necessary because we are under not only a, a DES, Department of Environmental Security, uh, that's a state agency, but an e EPA uh, court order as to what has to be done, and that goes way back. So what you're seeing is the operating budget plus a lot of capital expenditures that are made to just keep up with the, the, the condition of the system. Is that pretty, pretty clear now? Had, now the, so there's still a fairly decent cash balance, but it's not enough uh, in terms of sewer replacement. There's a lot of sewers that need to be replaced, still some equipment at the sewage treatment plant that needs to be redone. Uh, so rates are probably going to go up. Uh, the, uh, although the sewer rates for Nashua are about half what they are, maybe a little more than half, but significantly less than Manchester, an equivalent community. So um, I think maybe that gives you kind of the context of an explanation of what's going on. Now, why don't we let Sarah Marsh tell you a little bit about the river, what's going on there. She should come up here. And um, uh, then we'll take questions for either on either area or anything else that you'd like to uh, talk about. All right, thank you all for having me. Um, I was going to talk to you a bit about the Downtown Riverfront Master Plan. Um, how many of you know that this exists? We did it about a year ago. Oh, that's pretty good. Nice. So um, this was approved about a year ago, and um, thanks to the mayor and the Board of Aldermen, um, a TIF district has been formed to fund some of these improvements, and we're moving forward with them. So um, the Downtown Riverfront Master Plan focused on an area from, and I'm sorry about the tiny <laughs> size, but from the new Broad Street Parkway Bridge, um, down past the Main Street Bridge, all the way down to the railroad bridge by VAE um, that you can walk across that pedestrian bridge. So it focused on that area, and it was a community input driven program about what do we want to do to improve our riverfront, to attach it more to downtown, um, and to enhance this asset that we have that we just haven't paid nearly enough attention to. And so um, we came up with six big ideas that, or you came up with six big ideas that we're working on implementing now. And of course I lost my page, I apologize. Um, and so these are the things that we're focusing on getting done now. The first, um, and this report is on our website. There's a really cool video too that's like a minute long if you want to see the riverfront that we flew with the drone um, that actually shows some of the improvements overlaid on top of it as well. Um, which is a good visualization. So connectivity was the number one. We have that one beautiful cantilevered bridge that goes from Main Street by Peddler's Daughter to Jackson Falls condos and back to Margaritas. Um, the goal is to do that on all four, all the other three sides of the Main Street bridge to really connect you from Main Street down to the Riverwalk, which does exist in many areas, but isn't that easy to get to yet. Um, and so we've put out an RFP for engineering um, with my um, 
counterpart Tim Cummings, the Economic Development Director, and we do hope to have an engineering team on board to help start designing that before the end of the summer. Um, and hopefully, it'll take about a year for permitting on that because doing anything next to or on the river takes longer than you might anticipate. Um, to be fair to the river and all the different um, organizations that have jurisdiction. So uh, we hope to be moving forward with that in not too long. Currently, we are working on a lighting design plan for the whole riverfront. Um, and we had a great public meeting on that earlier this week. And we should have a new design plan for lighting along the whole length by the end of the summer, which we hope to put out to bid. And we'll be either installing later this fall, depending on the construction season and costs, which are extremely high this year, we'll probably have to put it back out to bid over the winter to get a little bit of lower costs and do it in the spring. Oh, I need to be closer. Now, Sarah mentioned a TIF district. What that means is tax increment financing. So what that says is there's a, there's a boundary around, a pro, uh, around the river, an area around the river, where any increase in property values as a result of new construction, development, or anything else are captured for the benefit of doing improvements along the river. So the, the underlying purposes are, first of all, to beautify the river for our use, and so that our people can enjoy the river, but also to help uh, do a you know, chicken and egg thing where the, the, the improvements, as the area improves, those values are captured to reinvest around the river to make more improvements to hopefully bring, make more river improvements, which will bring more private investment to the area. So the idea is to use the uh, value that is being created to enhance the river, which, which creates more value, more private investment, and ultimately, you know, a better downtown and a better riverfront. And so the, uh, along those lines, um, another thing we're working on right now is permitting to remove all the invasive species along the sides of the riverfront. One of the number one things we heard is that um, maintenance is, a tr is a difficult and you can't even see the river this time of year, right? There's so much vegetation grown in, there's so many invasive species. And so um, permitting invasive species removal along the side of the river, again, takes a long time to be careful with all of the environmental agencies. But a big piece of that is going to be tree removal. Um, we will not be removing stumps. We will not be um, disturbing the banks necessarily, but we do intend to remove quite a few trees that are covered in invasive species that would be dying after we sprayed them anyways beforehand as a way to save um, the riverbank and to keep it stable. Um, and we hope to do that from all the way down to the Cotton Mill Bridge, um, all the way down towards past the library eventually. Um, on the south bank. So you will see before this, the end of this summer a substantial amount of tree removal that will then be followed by invasive spraying this fall and next spring. And hopefully you'll have a lot better access um, next spring to the river. And so those are some of the immediate things that we're working on. Um, and there's a whole bunch of more information in here and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Any thoughts or questions on this? So we'll, oh, I yes, Fran. When the plan is finished, will it be like a, a walking loop? You can go across bridges, along one side, across back the other? Yeah. Thank you. So yes, when the loop is finished, it will be, um, it will be a, a loop that you can go along the riverfront all the way down from Main Street, either side, behind the library, all the way down to the railroad bridge, back through BAE, along the existing cantilevered bridge, um, behind or in front of Riverside Barbecue, down to Cotton Mill and the Cotton Mill Square, um, across either that Cotton Mill Bridge or to continue and go further to the Mill, to the, uh, Mill Yard Technology Park underneath the river, which will get you connected to Mine Falls Park. I mean, Mine Falls Park is a jewel in the center of our city. It's 300 acres and it's less than two, it's like a three minute walk from the Main Street Bridge, but you don't know that it's there. Um, there's wayfinding signage as part of that, helping to connect these dots. I and mean, we really want to, and we heard from you and the community and the people who work downtown, that they really want to be able to connect to our larger trails. We have the Heritage Rail Trail that connects into Mine Falls Park. So the goal is to have these larger and larger loops of recreation, green space, and connections that do connect. So, you know, if you wanted to take a three-mile run 
or a five mile run or a 10 mile run. Um, you can do all of that right from downtown or using our awesome VO ride bikes um, or, you know, so that we really can have some good alternate modes of transportation and connecting downtown to that fabulous green space that is Mine Falls Park. All right. Anything else? What, uh, well, let me, anything else you'd like to ask now? Let me, um, you know, the, over, the, over the, I can't help but do this. So over the last uh, few years, Nashua's got a lot of accolades. So we think that our entire community, by working together, is, you know, just to grill out of great people, have helped us to uh, accomplish a lot of these things. So in 2018, Nashua was named one of the safest places to, to retire in the country. In 2018, Nashua was named one of the best, the ninth best run, best run city in the state, in the, in the United States. Ninth best run in the United States. 2018, Nashua was named the best place for millennials in Hillsborough County. Again in 2018, Nashua was the, named the most diverse and inclusive place to live in New Hampshire. In 2018, Nashua, uh, it was said, it was decided that Nashua had some of the least amount of crime in a mid-sized city in the United States. In 2017, Nashua Manchester was named one of the happiest places in the country. In 2017, Nashua was named the safest city in the country. And in 2017, Nashua was named one of the best cities to live in America. So we, we, uh, we think that we're accomplishing some of these things because the community for so long it has many people who love the city and are working very hard, both at their jobs and in schools and in businesses and in city government. And I think uh, these things help to show that we really have a, a wonderful place to live. Now, how about Lori or Rick? Do you have anything you'd want to add? I, go ahead, Rick. I know you want to talk about the school. I don't know if anybody has. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jim. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions about the middle school project, but this is one of the schools that will be touched. Um, right now, in the first phase, we're evaluating the cost of renovating the Elm Street Middle School versus building a new school in the southern part of Nashua. Uh, but the other two middle schools will also be involved in, in the development. The plan is to have all three schools have 800 students. Uh, this school already has close to 800, so it's not really doesn't need a lot of additional space. Penachuk, on the other hand, still has portables, which we were supposed to get rid of 20 years ago, as does Elm Street. So um, the, that's one of the things that will go. Uh, right now, we're looking at the possibility of Penichuk having 10 new classrooms, so that will be more construction than here. All three, well, all, of, all the schools in Nashua, but particularly as part of this project, uh, the new security upgrades will be put in. Uh, this school probably sooner than others, where after the initial day starts, um, to get into the school, you will have to be buzzed in through the front door, be cleared by the central office before you can get access to the school. All the other outside doors will be armed and have cameras on them. Um, and they will have uh, access uh, to the police department as well as the police having access to the cameras for the outside. So uh, the first year of the project is to evaluate the, what needs to be done to each of the schools, the cost of, of either renovating Elm Street or building a new school, and the evaluation will be made sometime later this year as to the path forward. Um, the other thing that they're looking into is the uh, curriculum at the middle schools to try and make the, the middle schools uh, a more friendly environment for students coming out of elementary school and transitioning to high school. Uh, a lot of times, I was on the Board of Ed for 10 years, and a lot of times we lose kids in the middle schools. It's such a dramatic change, especially when it was junior high school, such a dramatic change from elementary school to high school. Uh, when they come to middle school, uh, a lot of kids tend to get lost. Uh, and 
So there's an educational piece that's being upgraded as well for all three middle schools. So hopefully when we get done, uh, we'll have one of the best middle school uh, series, if you will, uh, for, for uh, New Hampshire. And uh, the kids will have a much better experience, a much better learning experience, and be much better prepared for going to high school. If anybody has any questions. This, this study for repairing or replacing Elm Street. Now, right now, I, I, I'm assuming, I'm guessing that the new one down the south end would be around the Buck Meadow area or something like that. Yes. Well, what is the cost of transportation? It's got to be astronomical. Um, actually, they're doing two things. One, we're doing a, a traffic study as, as part of all of this. Mm -hmm. And um, the students right now that live in that section of town get bus to Elm Street, which okay. so it's just sort of, they get shorter bus routes. And, okay. all right. and if we have a school in each, in the northern tier of the city, the middle of the city, and then the southern part, mm -hmm. the busing should be shorter routes. Okay, uh, along with that, say you, you will, we end up putting a new school down the south end. What becomes of the existing buildings? Well, as I tell people in this study, as soon as we make the decision that it's not a school anymore, it's someone else's project. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, so, but it's still, city, but it's still so, a city. So uh, I think uh, the, the first of all, Keefe would, Keefe would be preserved. We really need to preserve Keefe as an auditorium. There are various things that could be done with the remainder of the school, but one thing, one area what, where we've already heard a lot of interest is there are, there's the possibility of converting the Elm Street School to, to, to housing, like you saw on the, on yes. the uh, Franklin Street National Corp conversion. Mm -hmm. And people like the, the, the company that did that have asked about, well, you know, is, would Elm Street be a possibility? And it seems like, well, maybe it would. We could realize, you know, at least some, some uh, a revenue as a result of the sale of the building for some price, and then we would see uh, the building upgraded, and we would get something on the tax roll. So, and we would provide a place for people to live right in the inner city, close to downtown. So, so I think that is a likely possibility. And yeah. the Keith would probably stay there. Yes. The which? Keith. Keith, the auditorium. Yeah. So that we could seal that off from the school, and it really would be. Uh, more available for outside the groups. Thing is parking around there. Yeah, parking is tight. Unless parking is tight. Parking's a, a, an issue even for the school, and right. over the last few years we've had three okay. students hit by cars on Elm Street, so mm -hmm. it's not very safe. Um, so one of the, one of the goals of the committee that I chair is to make sure that we do all these changes at a reasonable cost, that we don't go overboard in any area. And the other is that um, I was uh, 35 years at BAE and Sanders uh, Lockheed, and my responsibility was life cycle cost on military projects. So, in the in the to the architects and the construction manager, life cycle cost is, is a key element of this project. Um, for instance, we're looking at doing solar on top of the new school, um, and hopefully we get net metering fixed up in the state. <laughs> hey, we're both in there. <laughs> um, but the other thing is, um, just as one example, in Elm Street right now, the R value of the outside walls is R2. Middle schools require an R18. Wow. If we spend yeah. as much money as we can insulating the outside walls, the most we'll get up to is an R11. Yeah. That's just one area. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, we've had to hire another firm to come in and evaluate the structural integrity of the hallways. Uh, we've had some issues over the years with parts of those hallways and so all of this is being taken into account so when we're done with this first phase we'll have a document that says this is the way we're going and this is why we're going that way and 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 to give an excellent education but at a reasonable price right yes um, when you just mentioned changing, When you mentioned taking um, potentially Elm Street and converting it to housing, how does that affect um, 
all of the other, the infrastructure within there. For instance, you put, uh, I don't even know how many units, but you put considerable amount of units in um, an area where there are two or three elementary schools probably already somewhat jammed. So how does, how does that trickle down? Because it must be part of the master plan that you plant X amount of housing and what that means, just like West Hollis Street where BB Rubber was in, I don't even know how many units are over there, but there has to be some there, there, is, there is an impact on the school population, of course, depending on kind of the mix of the units. So in most of these downtown, but, but on the one hand, school, new, school kids add costs. But on the other hand, we don't want to run out of school children either. I mean, that means the community is getting very, very old. So um, we have seen over the years a de declining school population gradually. But in, and now I'm saying from say 20 or 30 years ago, now the, the population is like 11, 2, 11, 3. At one point, not that long ago, it was 13,000, maybe in the, in the 80s or early 80s. But in recent years, the population has remained fairly stable. Uh, as new, so, so some of it depends on the mix of units. For example, the, the conversion on Franklin Street, I think, has very few children in it. Clock Tower has some, but not that many. So, of course, where you get the largest concentration of children is actually single-family homes, where you know the a number of kids per unit is a lot more than in apartments. Could it add? Could it, depending on what is built, depending on the circumstances at the time, could it add kids? Yes, uh, but on the other hand. That may do nothing more than stable, you know, stabilize the population. I mean, there is no absolutely clear projection as to how many kids we're going to have even next year. I mean, often, often those numbers fluctuate. So certainly, if we get to that point, if we get a housing proposal, if we decide that that's the way to go, we would be looking at the then current elementary school and, and, and middle school, high school populations, uh, but would have that in mind when we make a decision as to how, how best to go. So what do you think? I, I think it's a complicated issue. Yes. You know, without a doubt. I mean, nobody wants to see a building empty. Right. Oh, that magnitude. There are, I mean, I, you know, there are some, in addition to these structural problems and the inability, the, the, the really the inability to insulate the building very well, and Rick is documenting all this, so this, this are just general observations. There are a lot, there are additional costs that are associated with renovating an ongoing school than building a new school. For example, what do you do with the lunch, what do you do with meals while that part of the school is being renovated. So I think the answer there is you would have to build an, a temporary cafeteria outside the school walls for at least a year. And that is some millions of dollars, which would then be lost entirely because that would then be taken down, right. The other thing is, of course, for our Elm Street kids right now, we don't have, every, all the, this school and right. Penichuk have athletic fields and other ways that the kids can exercise for, for teams and the like. And yes, Elm Street has some of that, but they have to, they have to go somewhere else. And there's no on-school on recreation or athletic facilities, right? So that's another issue that um, probably will be taken into consideration. So it is sad to lose a new school, an old school. But you know, when we, I think uh, the decision was once made to sacrifice the Spring Street School for a courthouse and instead have Penichuk. And I, you know, I have to think the kids at Penichuk are better off where they are than had they been downtown at Spring Street. Sure. Another thing, if, if we did renovate Elm Street, that's a four year plus project because we have, we have to keep moving people around. Rick, take the microphone. Uh, yeah, you. so um, that, not only adds time, it adds, and time always adds cost. 
So there's a big cost factor there to take into consideration. And if we renovated Elm Street, a lot of the things were built when uh, I went to high school there. Yeah. The cafeteria and the gymnasium on Chestnut Street and, and all that all have to be torn down because they have structural problems now. And uh, there'd be a, the front of the school would actually go to the back of the school. And so there's a lot of, a lot of pieces to the Elm Street if we renovated that that are going to add cost and time. Uh, we can build a new school in the Southern National in less than two years. So uh, again, we're doing all the analysis now and collecting all the facts and the data and we'll present that to the public uh, probably in the August to October time frame. That land that you're going to build on the school, if you do in South Nashua, is yours already. It's Correct. Yours. Correct. So it's not something that's happening. So that was reserved at a time when there was a housing project, housing subdivision. Is that right, like where Captain's Corner, where the near there, just are? just uh, oh, I know. up Buck, Buck, Buck Meadow, yes. to Buck Buck Meadow, yes. about a uh, quarter of a mile. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, it's interesting. I'm going to segue into a, a, another issue, but I think it's related. Uh, this has to do with the Downtown Entertainment Center. Yes. Which I think was put out for referendum, and I think it barely passed with the idea that we wouldn't be spending any money unless we got that $4 million of private uh, money flowing in to show there was a real interest. I, I would put that project in the want category, not the need category. And it does seem that we're starting now to expend resources when we haven't got the prerequisite private donations. Right. We're talking about rebuilding a school, which we need. We don't want. We need. And if we're going to husband our precious resources and the tax dollars of the, of the homeowners here, I would like to suggest to you that you back off on the want project and concentrate on the need project, which is rebuilding the new school. Um, now, could I, would you mind if I address the Performing Arts Center in terms of want versus need? So there is still a requirement that we bring in $4 million of outside money before the project can proceed in the form of either tax credits or private funds or both. Projection now is the experts think we can do $6.5 million, but that's in the works. In terms of want versus need, um, there is an economic development strategy behind the idea of the Performing Arts Center. And you can maybe agree or disagree with that, but it's not just because someone says, well, I'd like to go to a, a, you know, I'd like to go to a performance downtown, which yes, we'd like to do, but that's not really the reason that the city is investing money there. So we have a downtown that is an economic development opportunity. Right now, it is the, the quarter mile, which consists, the quarter square mile, which consists of the, down, the central business district, which is the main street and kind of the mill yards, pays $6 million in taxes, but requires very few services. I mean, people think, oh, a lot of money is getting, gets spent downtown. Well, kind of, but downtown, subsidizes the rest of the city, as does Amherst Street and the South End Danny Webster Highway, because it pays more in taxes than even close the services that are required. No gar there's no even garbage collection down there. So how do we build on that tax base and strengthen the tax base down there? We need to stimulate private investment. We need to bring and 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 create a bigger customer base for the businesses that exist, both those things. Even though Nashua is a relatively affluent community, citywide, especially compared with other cities in New Hampshire and like Lowell and Lawrence and the like, that census district right there is the poorest census district, the 293 out of 293 in the state of New Hampshire. So if by investing money down there, we can grow the tax base and add to that $6 million and make it nine, that alone will more than pay for any performing arts center. And the 
idea is that if we can operate a commercially viable center there, we can bring 50, 60, 70, 80,000 people to Main Street on an annual basis, all of whom will probably spend money elsewhere. In addition, we are, we, New Hampshire, are struggling with the problem that we are an aging state. We're the, it depends, I, you know, I hear the second or the third, it's, Verm it's Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire are the oldest states in the United States and getting older. And if we want to prosper in the future, if we want Nashua to thrive in the future, which as, you know, one of the more senior members in the city, I want to see happen, and if we want to see our young people stay here, we need to have a city that young people like and that we like. You know, I mean, everybody likes. But there are certain things that help us uh, become a place where all generations want to live. Thing, and an active downtown is one of the things that is at the top of the list for maintaining a, 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 and, and attracting at least the, you know, the, the newer residents. Um, the Performing Arts Center is part of that. Getting rail is part of that. Getting the downtown housing, this, the, the, the 500 units I just talked about, the conversion on Franklin Street, a big, big step forward, some music concerts downtown. Believe it or not, the Pride Parade, very important in terms of making Nashua a place where people want to come. So the Performing Arts Center is part of that. Now, so we think over the long term, the investment that we make there will pay off. And again, you could just, you know, I think you could, but I just want you to know that it's not just, oh, we want, you know, there's some people who'd like to go to a performance, so let's just give it to them. No, there is, a, there is a strategy. And that is why when some people floated the idea, well, let's, bu let's buy Daniel Webster College and put the Performing Arts Center there. Well, that was a bad idea for various reasons because that, you know, those buildings are not in good shape and the Performing Arts Center out there is way too small and would cost more than the one downtown. But, but even if that weren't true, we would never spend $15 million out there. Why? Because then you'd have a, a place where people would drive in and just drive out and that would be it. And that wouldn't be worth the investment because we wouldn't stimulate business activity like a Main Street Performing Arts Center will do. And as we've looked, there was a study that, you know, we did a feasibility study, and as we've looked at the impact that Performing Arts Centers have in other communities, it is definitely positive. So that is the reason, that's why, you know, uh, we could do, you know, the, the school, we could go with Elm, we could go with Elm Street for another 20 years. I mean, I, well, you know, who knows what, it, it's hard to distinguish a need from a want, but it'll be great to have a new school. I'm totally behind that, but I also think we need the Performing Arts Center to, for the reasons that I've described. Now, those are reasons, I'm just, I just want you to know there is a strategy there. Yeah, uh, oops, yes. Okay, uh, I do have a question uh, regarding the space uh, uh, the outside, the green. The, the what? The, the green, like parks. Uh, so we bring, in, uh, we bring in family over family over family over family. I came here to Nashua probably 15, 20 years ago, so I was one, one of them. And uh, you're driving down the street now and you see Acres and acres taken down, putting up building houses, one family, two family, ten family. I'm in the construction business, so it should be good for me, but it's not. Why? Because we're running out of space. We're running out of space for kids. Uh, there is. Uh, we go to the field, uh, mayor. Uh, after I work 13, 14 hours, I got to drive down to one of the field, the city field. And uh, I got to go to Lowe's, spend $100 on material, grab my own generator, go over there and try to fix a, a net so can a seat, can a Nashua kid play a soccer game on a Sunday. And I got to do this three days before the game. So we're talking about spending all these millions like nothing. Like you, you just said, the, the, the art center over there, the music center. Can I tell you something? 
The other night we went out for dinner, uh, it was Friday night, we went to surf downtown to help out stand up. It took us probably 25, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to find, to find a parking spot. So we're bringing all these thousands and thousands and thousands of people in, in downtown Nashua, where are they going to park? Unless, uh, unless, uh, that's one thing. But my, my now I think you've asked two questions. Can I? Yeah, yeah. But my I can answer them. Because I, I never had the chance to, to come and do this. So yeah. this is a lot of things that, 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 that we got to see it. You know what I mean? And the biggest thing is uh, building all these houses, but what is the space for the people to do something? What right. Is it? Right, I understand. I've been in, Man I've been in, I've been in Bedford, and, uh, and uh, we get told that uh, we were playing in a field, they say, so you know what this field was maintained by? I say, no. The person, who, the builder who, who just built 21 single family houses here, the city made them to build a, a soccer field or, or a baseball field, whatever you want to use that. You want to go walk your dog, you could do that. Over here, I don't see any of that. Like I said, I gotta work 13, 14 hours, then go to Lowe's, spend under box, go to, to, the, to the field, drive down the field and fix a net so that the kids can play that three days later. I, and I, I live in a 2,000 square feet house and I pay $7,000 a year taxes. So where's my tax money? Uh, I, I gotta use duct tape to put the nets together. So this city doesn't have people, that they do that? I see thousands of uh, city workers around it. There's nobody in charge to say, say, you know what? Can you guys go around and try to fix this so the kids can play or to whoever the adult can play? Because you've got 40, uh, uh, over 40, over 60, uh, 10 years old, 8 years old, 6 years old. I remember back when in, in, back in the days when I first started, go clean up the shed down, uh, what you, what's it called down there? At, uh, no, the one uh, uh, on Congress Street, and then you go down uh, where, where the, the CDS, all those uh, gardens, people can oh, play. Greeley Park. Park. Oh, really? Park. I went over there to chase the mice off the, the shed. I don't have to do that. I'm a parent. My son's six years old. I got to chase the, the mice out of the shed. So that, this is what we, we got to see about it, too. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know who, who we're going to talk about this. Is anybody responsible for that? I, I'm not sure. Well, you are right that we do not have enough fields. And uh, we have, you know, 14, 15 soccer fields. We did add two at Charlotte Avenue School last year. And we have designated uh, this park at the end of Jewel Lane for another rectangular field, a full size one. Uh, now we found some ledge there, so it might have to be s some switching around. But you're right, we don't have enough fields, and so the city is trying to address that. The problem is, and, and, the, and we have a lot of kids who want to play soccer, and soccer and lacrosse are very important, and we uh, have a problem in that the use, the fields are overused because we don't have enough, so the condition of those fields is that you know, they tend to get worn and there's not enough time for the grass to regenerate. Uh, so we're working on it. Now we're trying to find empty space, but it is easier said than done. Land is expensive. Uh, and uh, land is expensive. So we're thinking about different options. Uh, we always are looking for more land. We could have used your help a couple years ago. <laughs> Because, because down in the southwest on Gilson Road. We were there. Oh, you were there? Yes. And you saw what happened, right? So you tried to help, but, <laughs> but we needed like 100 more of you. Uh, we tried to build two soccer fields, and maybe we could have gone beyond that. That was turned down by the planning board because there were so many people that came out in opposition. Now, we're, I, I spoke to the why, and we've kind of let that sit because even though the city owns it, you know, we lost that and we were out, the, the socket, the pro field people were outnumbered like 10 to 1 or whatever. Um, we have talked to the Y about maybe trying to do something with the Y down there because this is land that was bought for the purposes of passive and active rec recreation and it's like 100 acres and the city's been prevented from building up fields on its own land. So, 
Uh, we are trying, we get that, and uh, I mean, I think it's an area where we need to make, I mean, we could talk more about the details. There's many, you know, this field and that one. And I mean, one option that we need to look at is the possibility of artificial turf. Now, that's a very expensive, 500,000, maybe more per field. But if and when we get to that, we want to make sure that we do that in an area where vandalism will not be an issue. Uh, there is some possible sources of revenue for that, which we're trying to develop. Um, and maybe we've been too slow in developing. I, I don't think we've been too slow in trying to establish new fields because we, as you saw that night with our stuff we've done, have tried to do, which didn't, we couldn't get approved. But maybe we should have more quickly uh, tried, to, tried to work on our, you know, artificial turf fields. And now that you've raised it, it makes me think, you know, maybe we should just bite the bullet on one of these and just have two or three artificial turf fields. If we did, of course, then use is unlimited, basically. And you know, you'd, uh, it would greatly expand the ability of the kids to play. So we. I mean, I agree that it is very important. These programs are extremely important. The kids uh, need that activity. We need open space. Uh, soccer is growing. Lacrosse is growing. So I take your point and uh, I would say that we don't have agree to with you on the importance of it. Yeah, I would say we don't have to uh, specific label this as soccer because it's not just soccer. It could be lacrosse, right. Yeah, yeah. So it could be for everybody. Yeah. We don't want to just or cricket. I mean, we got cricket now too, yes. It could be any, anything. People can, you know, if I pick, they pick whatever, the drop, they can put a dog in it if they want. They will just take a walk. The, the, the idea is, uh, the idea, the idea, I'm already loud, so if I put <laughs> this one, it's a bit louder. So the idea is, uh, the idea is, uh, I go back to that. I was very impressed when uh, when we went out uh, to, to, to this city, and I gotta say, Bedford. The, we go there, you drive up, you, you look like you you're in the middle of a residential area. You are, and then all of a sudden there's a field, and then then you talking, you start talking to the neighbor over there, and says, uh, this the city, he obligated the builder. I, you wanna you wanna you wanna make a ten million dollar on this property or whatever what you wanna do. Then spend two hundred thousand to put a little green and maintain it. So that's, I guess. What's well, there, there are legal. You know, they might have gotten the developer in Bedford to agree to something, but we do not. There is. We are constrained by state laws that we cannot require someone to build a soccer field in order to build a house that, or build ten houses. I mean, we don't really have that legal ability. Mm -hmm. uh, Just seeing, you know, if the farm, I don't know what happened in Bedford. Because the funds is not there. Well, of well maybe we should make another run at that, uh, you know, the, the area that you went and yeah. appeared about. I mean, there's a lot of room there. And uh, yes, there was some neighborhood opposition, but it was the, you know, the, the mountain biker people that were really. A, yeah, well, it came, you know, at the last yeah. second, right? I mean, it wasn't, that went through the Board of Aldermen because the Board of Aldermen approved money for that to build the fields on the land we owned. And there was not a word of opposition. And then suddenly that night at the planning board, you know, bang, you know. But just yesterday, I did meet with the Y with some other people, and we, we talked about that land. And we said, you know, maybe if the Y were to get involved, they, they're, they kind of, they have a board, they have a lot of kids, the people that might support it. Maybe we have some kind of partnership with them in terms of operating and developing these fields. Maybe that will help us generate enough public support to make sure that it doesn't happen again what happened the last time. Uh, you know, and it seemed like the Y, the Y is very interested. So, and they have, you know, more prestige than the city has maybe, and they can help us uh, make sure that happens. But you're absolutely right. We don't have enough fields, and we should do something about it. Yeah, and um, my last, I don't know if you knew that, I'm sure there's, uh, you had a million things to do and to know, but there, there is anybody that's uh, in charge of the, this equipment that's on the field? Yes, yes, yes. So Nick Caggiano, head of Parks, Parks and Rec, is in charge of the, all the soccer fields. Um, now, you know, is he understaffed? Probably. He has, yeah. he has 17 people in the Parks Department. 
Uh, could we use 35? Yep. I mean, if we had 35, there's probably still work for them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all, of course, money, budgets, pressure, tax rate, you know, and all that. Uh, but you're right that these fields are very important, as is the, as are the other parks, Greeley Park, Mine Falls Park. Those are all of this open space. And I disagree to some degree that the, the idea that we, well, we don't have anything. I mean, we have five, four, five hundred um, acres of conservation land in the southwest. We have a 300 acre um, Mine Falls Park. We have Greeley Park. We have other parks. So there are a lot of parks. We don't have enough fields, though. I mean, there's no question about that. All right, thank you very much. I just wanted to say thank you to every one of you who came out tonight. I learned more from you guys than you probably learned from us. And it's important to, to stay involved, like you people that you know were here last year or involved in something last year. It's really important that we hear what you have to say because we're really here to work for you. Um, and it's, it's very important. Um, Cecilia just reminded me about the uh, green space that we're trying to keep at our library. There was a, a design uh, group that met last week to talk about uh, the green space at our library. So we are conscious of it when we can, but I think we've heard loud and clear from you that we need to do more. And, and I think, you know, I, I will agree to work more with the mayor and see what we can do with that. Um, but like I said, thank you all very much for coming out. I learned more from you. So thank you for that. I mean, I was really disappointed when those fields went down. You know, um, we had the mountain bikers. Yes, they have an activity, but there are various places they can ride. But we weren't taking a large... Yeah, I know. I agree, totally. <laughs> and, you know, I met with the guy who led that yeah. afterwards. And I said, look, you know, we're taking less than 10% of the land. What if we make the... the uh, uh, trails go around the fields, you know, something, you know. And uh, the answer was absolutely not one quarter inch of compromise. So, uh, just like the government. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think we should wait till we know we have a, a broader base of support before we go at it again. Uh, that's why, you know, maybe the getting the Y involved would help. But it was a big disappointment because we do have, what, 1,500 kids in soccer, right? Soccer plus lacrosse plus, you know, it's so. Maybe it's 15 just in the rec Yeah, it's like th a couple thousand kids playing playing soccer and, mo and another 500 to 1,000 playing lacrosse. So we've got a lot of kids. It's very important that they be able to, it, it, play on fields of quality. We have lost, since I was mayor before we used to have the um, October, uh, the um, Columbus yeah. State Tournament. Right. Right. We've lost that because of the conditions of the field, right? And in part because of these traveling leagues and they, right. you know, they charge a lot of money for the players and then they use that to build their own fields and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, you're right, it would be great. I mean, that is something we should work on, no question about it. Yes. Uh, there have been a lot of stories in the news in recent months about the disruption of the recycling markets worldwide. And I know there's also been some issues with the city. Can you um, give us some comments and status as where recycling is with the city right now? Yes, of course. Well, when we started recycling, when I was mayor before, believe it or not, um, <laughs> markets were a lot different. There was a paper mill in Maine where we were sending the paper. There was Coca-Cola in Nashua where we were sending cans and stuff like that, and they were processing that. Um, then and well, there was separation taking place on the street. Now that's a very expensive way to go. So the technology evolved and now there is single stream recycling. You put everything in and then technologically they separate things, which was working okay for a long time. 
And up to about a year and a half ago, uh, the markets had did, you know, weakened. The markets, in terms of getting disposing of the recycling, had weakened. So the city wasn't making money on getting rid of recycled materials, but we were only paying 50, 75 cents a ton to dispose of it. Then, and, but most was going to China. Then China said, we don't want recycling anymore. And that's what, of course, you've read about. It's yeah. disrupted the markets completely. So now, in a period of a year, the, the cost for the city to dispose of recycling has gone from 80 cents a ton, 80 cents a ton to $80 a ton. So before it was a trivial cost, you know, 80 cents a ton uh, to get rid of the recy uh, recycling. Now, last year, or in the current fiscal year, uh, we spent, we budgeted $400,000. That was not enough, and the Board of Aldermen transferred another 100000 of so-called contingency money into recycling, 500000 a year to dispose of the recycling this year. Now, Public Works hopes that the market gets better, but there's no guarantee. So this year we budgeted again, this year meaning the budget we just passed, looking forward to fiscal 20. We budgeted 400,000 again with the hope that that would be enough, and in the hopes that mar the markets will improve. But that's totally unclear that that will happen. Now one thing that worries me is uh, we, 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 when we put this recycling contract out to bid, there's only one bidder, Casella. And so they take it away. But they also are kind of at the mercy. Uh, first of all, they are, they are landfilling all the glass. Once it's separated, they're landfilling the glass. So the glass isn't being recycled at all. That's being landfilled by Casella. Wow. Uh, secondly, it worries me because they say it's going to Southeast Asia, which maybe it is, but it's not like the old days where you know it's going to a paper mill in Maine. I, you know, who knows really? It's, they put it on a barge to go to Southeast Asia. You know, yeah. Are they are they dumping it in the ocean? I, you know, who knows? So, I, probably not. But we don't know. You know, who knows? We probably not. But, but. Uh, so it is a, it is an issue, but we have we don't know what you know. There's no clear answer because we have many many people who are very very dedicated to recycling, separating every week, putting you know, yeah. bought their own totes and m myself included, my wife Vicky over here. Uh, so I think for the time being, we're just going to continue to maintain in the hopes that things improve. But if costs were to go up from here, I mean, I think we would really have to consider landfilling at least part of the recycling. I mean, we do have a landfill that uh, is now been permitted for phase three, which will give us another 10 or 15 years. That's under construction right now. And then we think we can permit a so-called phase four, which would last for another 40 or 50 years beyond that. So we, assuming those things come to pass, we have quite a bit of landfill space. And you know, is it worth it to spend more than five hundred thousand dollars a year to, to dispose of recycling? Uh, maybe not. So uh, you know, it's definitely a problem. Yes. Is there anything? Is there anything being looked at to, like, revise the? Recycling instructions, like maybe we should stop putting, you know, glass bottles and things, or things like. There's also been talk in some of these things about materials that can't be used, which you would think you could put in, you know, certain papers or a certain amount of dirt gets on something, so yes. forth and so on. Well, you know, Public Works, we've thought about putting out, you know, we're not going to take glass, but it's such a small. You know, it is a small 
sliver of the, the volume of recyclables in, in total. So that's a possibility, but it won't materially change things, even if people hear that message and even if they stop recycling glass. Um, I think Public Works has tried to put out the message, you know, don't make sure everything is clean, don't put all these things uh, in the recycling. They put that message out, not everybody hears it, it might be in the paper, it might not. Uh, you know, so certainly that can always be reinforced. We did uh, build a roof over the recycling area out at the, uh, out at the landfill. landfill, recycling area. That cost 200 and some thousand dollars. The point was there to try to prevent it from getting wet because that is a form of contamination and also increases the weight to make the recycling more desirable. And that may have an effect, but again, you know, it's not going to change, change, radically change the picture. Might have, you know, a marginal effect, hopefully. So uh, I think we did, did, we did a, uh, we presented all this to the Board of Aldermen, kind of were seeking their input and public input, and the decision was made kind of to stay the course for the time being, but that has to be, you know, reevaluated frequently, I would say, to decide whether it's really worth it. I mean, there are communities that just forget it. It's not, you know, as long as the conditions exist now, like they are now, it's, we shouldn't even bother. Um, I'm not saying we are at that point, I, or I am, but um, you've seen other communities take that course. And the, the, the public works doesn't want to, and I think they're right, they don't want to say, okay, let's stop recycling for three months just because, you know, then how do you restart it if the market got better? So I think we'd have to maintain and kind of try to see if conditions improve, at least for the time being. But I don't know, what do you think we should do? Um, it's something, you know, that, that I'm not certain of. I hear some stories that they're Fairly new that there are scientists that are developing plants where they can take things like plastic and turn it into diesel or to, you know, base plastic and things like that. And I don't know how soon they're going to come about or how successful you could be in attracting it, one of them to Nashua. Yeah, well, you know, there, there are these ideas that get discussed and hopefully something will develop that is dependable, but like for example, sometimes people say, well, there's somebody in Europe put plastic in the asphalt and there's a way to recycle it, you know, stuff like that. Um, no, we're not gonna put plastic in the asphalt because we gotta have these streets last and that, that will cause the quality of the asphalt to go down. I mean, the, the asphalt has to have a very specific uh, consistency and if we put plastic in there, you know, it's not gonna be as good. So. Hopefully some new technology will arise. I mean, that's another thing Public Works talks about. I mean, you know, there's so much money in this that maybe, uh, maybe that will push the development of technologies that, that uh, result in the use of, more use of recycling material. You know, I think that just the fact that so many Communities, everybody is recycling. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember they came around with, you know, the Boy Scouts came around and you put newspaper on the truck and they sold, mm -hmm. they sold newspaper. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't sell newspaper now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? I came here with a, a few concerns and questions. The primary concern I had was, you mentioned it right off the bat, about uh, Mr. Gidge not being well, because I was looking at the minutes from the automatic meeting, and he hadn't showed up since January 22nd, and I'm saying there's something wrong with his picture. I feel like I'm in, in 1750 where I'm being taxed with no, no representation. Well, uh, he has been there at times, but he was back in the hospital like, a, you know, a couple weeks ago. Um, so I think... I mean, he's very interested in what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's just he's physically unable to. But see, my, my point is, I'm having no voice in my yes. ward. In, in our ward. Yes. 
So well, hopefully it'll correct itself. Hopefully it'll get better soon. Alderman at large. Yeah, you do have that. I, I have an alderman at large, yes. Six of them. But, but maybe his one vote would sway something I'm either for or against. You understand what I'm saying? I do. It's, I understand. You know, I, I understand the concept of the alderman at large. Mm -hmm. But to me, that one vote could mean a lot. You know, Understood. So it's... Yeah. Uh, so I guess right now we have to live with his absence until we find out what's going on. Yeah. And, uh, okay. He came into City Hall. Um, he he had to go back in the hospital. I'm trying to think. You know, maybe See, a couple. Nothing was explained. I know. Yeah. A couple weeks thing. ago, he came but in with a with a walker. I mean, he's trying well. to get better. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. 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 But there was no inclination of what what was going on. I'm looking right. at it and saying, wait a minute. You, he's just not showing up for whatever right, reason. Right. Uh, right. But and, and another question I had watching the her chagrin, <laughs> the finance <laughs> meetings and stuff like that. And one of the things that stuck to me was we had there was a lot of discussion about police department overtime. And I'm saying, okay, I'm looking down the street with all this construction and stuff like that. I see national police vehicles, huts and whatever, and I'm saying, where does this fall in did is that overtime in that section of the budget, or is the overtime for the police department just for, like, say, major crimes or something like that? Because if it is lumped in, I would assume that the monies that the police department are getting paid for the policemen and the cruisers or whatever to be at a construction site would generate funds for the city. Uh, the, you um, the what I'm yes. Now the city, the the, poli the PD does not pay for the, the construction details. So when you see them out there, the PD is not paying for that. No, so no what, the, P, the, well, the, the police department is getting paid. What, what happens is the contractor hires the officer to be there. And oh, that does, money go, does not go to the city. No, but we don't pay the officer either. So the, the, the well, we are reimbursed for paying the officer. Technically, the city still pays him, but the city is reimbursed more than the that's, that's more than the contractor is paying. There's a, like an administrative fee on okay. top, so that does not cost the city government money when that happens, okay. and and that is a voluntary detail. Mm -hmm. That's why you see Milford yeah. there yeah, yeah, right. because they go yeah. through the national police, yeah. and if no one wants the yeah. the mm -hmm. job, again paid for by the contractor, yeah. then the contractor pays the Milford police. Right. Because that was, that was a concern of mine. I'm saying, well, is this part of the overtime budget? Right. And the answer is no, it is okay. not. What else? Looking out there. You said two concerns. You only no, gave me okay. one. Okay, well, I, I had a bunch. Uh, something <laughs> that came up is, and it was mentioned earlier, and Mr. Dowd mentioned it, prevent, like preventative maintenance. Yes. As a property owner, if you don't do X amount of repairs on them, anything, it's going to cost you more in the long run. And this preventative maintenance thing goes way back to when we were talking about the smokestack down in the mill yard. Uh, that was a bad one. This was, that was, not, that was not a good thing because I think the gentleman passed away. He made, I, I asked the question, I said, look, they were talking, what, 700 some odd thousand dollars to repair this thing. And I said, okay, we spend X, X dollars. How much money per year is going to be put in for maintenance? His answer was, Oh, we don't have to do anything for 20 or 25 years. Won't and be I'm his saying, problem. That's what he said. You know, and I'm saying, that is not a good answer. Yeah. Because as a taxpayer, and I'm saying you have to have X amount of dollars put aside to maintain that thing. Uh, Plus, if you ask a lot of people, they would say, what is that monstrosity <laughs> of a thing there? They have no yeah. concept of what it's about. There's not even a sign that says what it is. Well, it says million on it. But. Yeah, but you spent all that money. It should have had a little Something. kind of thing saying what it is. And, oh, they've uh, got the microphone right there, actually. Yeah, that's yeah. right here. What it is and, uh, you know, why it was preserved or whatever, because mm. it's part of the foundry. But Well, Rick can tell you, I mean, he is a I very strong proponent down. of... <laughs> Extremely Preventative strong. Uh, I spent my entire career looking out for that very subject. And when we built the two new high schools, that was paramount in our discussion of any and all materials. Mm -hmm. And both of those schools are about 16 years old now. And you walk yeah. into them, you look they look brand new. Mm -hmm. And that's because everything in there was built to last. Mm -hmm. Everything was built 
to be easily maintained. Mm -hmm. And that's the premise in the new middle school project. Yeah. The uh, old high school that we had to tear down, yeah. mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, my, I'm one of the proponents is don't build cheap because mm -hmm. it's going to cost you More in the long three run. times yeah. as much exactly. down the road mm -hmm. to take care of it. Yeah. So you have to use quality materials and know what you're doing mm -hmm. to build it the right way. But, but, but maintenance is uh, uh, huge, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it, we're doing much, much better in the schools yeah. uh, than they used to. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and another point on the, uh, like, the, like, like the smokestack, to me, the historical part of that whole project was the boiler room. My God, that hit. That he that worked hit. right there. Oh, Lester. you did? Did yeah. you work in he that? He worked in... Uh, Upstairs in Leicester. Oh, you, oh, you work for Lester? No, he well, worked I, for I, I, Austin yeah, Gordon. for Austin Gordon. It, uh, oh, yeah, I had 20, 20 odd years looking at that smokestack. But to me, the historical part was the boiler room because that hit, heated all of Sprague and everything else. I mean, that's, that, was the, that was worth keeping, you know, but it uh, didn't go there. Uh, and that old building where he worked, oh. that is a site. Oh. NIMCO. Yeah. Yes. Now, that's you know, there, it's, it's not in that shape because we're just forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I know the guy. The, there's yeah. the, 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 this is the Nimco building in the mill yard. Yeah. Very briefly, uh, Mr. Dr. Kias, mm. yeah. the city has been in long-term oh, yeah. litigation. We've gotten through nearly everything, but he's still <laughs> owned. We now own the building, he's evicted, we own the equipment, but he still owns a small part of the land under the building. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> which is, he owns, it's, it's an entity that he has. We have a judgment of $100,000 against a different entity that he owns. These are like corporations. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very hard legally to try to transfer a debt from one corporation to another. Sure. So that's in litigation. I, you know, so this is gonna be going on. But once we get that land, which probably we will at some point, and if he wanted to sell it, we would buy it. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, you know what he's <laughs> like. So, uh, uh, if we could buy it or we can get it, then we will do something with the building. But until we actually own the entire right. property, there's not a lot. At least you got the stuff around the camper yeah. and the yeah. old yeah. truck that was yeah. there for 25 years. Now, the, the now, yeah. cool. now, we have to leave soon, but okay. do yeah. the, uh, either of our members of the legislature have anything you want to add about what's going on in Concord? Maybe, maybe not. I call well, on. Um, <laughs> Uh, they're calling them unexpectedly. We're hoping so. Hoping to. Um, um, behind you. 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 Okay. Yeah, um, the net metering. We're hoping to override the um, governor's veto. We thought it would be today, but it'll be um, the 27th. We'll vote on that. So we've been getting lots of emails from everybody in favor, and I get some emails from constituents. So. Net metering would allow. Electricity sold out of a generating plant like solar to be sold at the same at retail rates, right? Basically, something like that. So you can trade off one for one electricity you use versus electricity you generate. It makes it more economically viable to generate alternative energy. All right, well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, what we, as Lori said, we do always learn a lot. Thank you for your comments. You, you make us work harder. That's good. And uh, so uh, we really appreciate your coming, and we'll certainly do this again next year. And I do hold a coffee down at Jaja Bell's every Wednesday morning. If you want to come to that, of course, you're more than welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.